This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day everybody, I hope you're well. I've got something different for you this time around. It's a chat with guitarist extraordinaire Mark Day from a group called The Happy Mondays. Now the group was instrumental in the emergence of rave culture in the north of England, therefore the rest of the world, and we discussed that topic in some detail. I should say the catalyst for the chat is due to a tour by the Happy Mondays across Australia in October 2023. Elsewhere, we discuss co-founder of the independent label Factory Records, Tony Wilson, and also the Hacienda Nightclub. If you're keen, check out the movie 24 Hour Party People, and there's a lot of biopics and that sort of thing and deep dives into the Hacienda and Factory Records available on YouTube. In addition, Mark is a great guitarist, so it was cool to talk to him about his thoughts on playing guitar in a band where it's not really noted for excellent guitar playing, but it is certainly there. Okay, so here he is, Mark Day from The Happy Mondays. So, what do you want to talk about? Are you still in the UK or do you live abroad these days? No, no, I'm still in Manchester. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, you haven't been inspired to go abroad to Spain or Portugal or somewhere like that? No, my mates are here. I don't want to isolate myself and become a nomad in the hills with nothing to do and even slower Mm. internet than I've got now. I'm quite happy, thank you. Yeah, my family's here. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, no, that's great. Even though I don't see them. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, no, I can relate to that. God almighty, yeah. Yeah, they sort of spread yeah. all over the place or just <laughs> locally? <laughs> um, just about a mile away, probably, no, two miles away, but it's my brother, never see his family, never bother, so oh, there you go. The deal, isn't it? I, I yeah. do try, I do try, but it's very trying. <laughs> oh, I hear you, mate. Yeah, I haven't spoken to my most of the members in my family for now decades it's just one of those things that happens doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> decades <laughs> good luck that, they're only a pain yeah. in the ass anyway <laughs> for, for the most part the oh, ones well, i don't talk to <laughs> no you're not yeah. wrong, you're not wrong, mate. you know so. uh, sorry i'm just gonna sneeze <laughs> excuse me i'll edit that out all right <laughs> there we go yeah. Something Mates. you can't help not doing, sneezing. Oh, yes, indeed, yeah. So are you looking forward to the trip back down? I'm not looking forward to the actual flight. It's a long way. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to Australia. This is what, you know, um, we've been before uh, about five years ago. Enjoyed yeah. it then. The crowd were amazing. And everybody's so nice. So, yeah, they even buy your pints now and again. Yeah, but love it, yeah. So I'm looking forward to going back, to be honest. It's going to be hard work because it's um, it's pretty compact. Yeah, I was looking at the schedule before. I'm going to bring it back up again. Um, mm. Yeah, I know they're sort of the, – the problem is you've got to catch a bloody plane the morning after each gig, haven't you? Giving you a plane exactly. one day after yeah, the other. So yeah. yeah, and then Joran's test. Yeah, you've got a day off. I suppose you could have a bit of a pint on the 18th in Brisbane if you're still here, if you're here then, on the 18th of October. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then on the 23rd, you could have one as well in Melbourne or Adelaide. There you go. So there's two two decent opportunities for you to have a bit then. Well, that's two pints. <laughs> How did you guys... <laughs> Probably. Yeah. How, how did you guys choose a set list this time around? Was it consensus or did you use data? Well, have you got the set list there? Because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, I can only imagine that it did be taken from the first, predominantly from the first three albums. Is that correct? Um, well, I don't know. I'll let you know. We've not even rehearsed for it yet. We're still doing summer festivals over in Britain. So, and that's just a usual hit. So, I'm not, yeah. not sure what I might do for Australia, but. We'll probably add a lot of songs that we've not done for a while in. Yeah, hopefully. It's a bit boring if you do the same thing every now and then. Yeah. When when you're playing some of the older hits, do you see that, like, is there recognition of those songs from the fans in in the front row, for example? Um, It's more dumbfounded, I think. (laughs) I don't know. 
I really don't know. They do like to hear the hits, but you know, it's you, you, it's the youngsters I like to see. The um, the mums and dads that bring the kids along say, "Yeah, check these out. This is what I used to listen to." So that's mm. nice. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, yeah. Have you decided on the types of guitars that you're going to bring down with you? Well, due to the cost and what we can carry, um, just one. Just one guitar, which oh, is shit. my main one. I'll probably hire anything else over there. That's if we can. Which I don't like doing, but, you know, what can you do? No, you're right. Yeah. So will the back line be supplied as well, or have you have you made it, given the promoter a preference on what you want behind you? We will do. Um, it'll probably be the same as what I've got, but um, we're not Iron Maiden. Even though, you know, I'd, I wouldn't mind flying me on, playing with my gear on it, but, yeah, we mm. um, just have to pop luck in it. No, I'm hearing you. Yeah. What's your what's your main rig these days? Like, what do you choose to use if you, if, you know, ultimately if you have a choice, like if you're playing at home in Manchester or what have you, what are you using? Well, I'm using, I've got two Fender uh, Deluxe amps that I use, and then... Um, that's it, really. Very basic. I don't really go for the complicated, massive rig effects. I'm not... Um, I have a simple... If, well, an effect box, which I don't know what it is. I forgot what it is. It's what Brian May used to use, and it puts all the sound effects, you know, your usual basic. And I have a, um, a boss, some sort of distortion pedal and a wah pedal. Mm. Um, I, I try and keep it very simple nowadays because, you know... It's too much button pressing and fiddling and once you eliminate all that, it makes it a lot easier for yourself to just relax on stage and enjoy the gig rather than messing about with yourself. Plus, I do in ears, so it's a monitor mix, so, you know, I leave the rest up to the techies. I'm a bassist. I also play guitar. You can see both behind me here, but as a bassist, I would would love to play bass for your guitar lines because you've got this very slinky rock-based funk sound that I don't think you get enough credit yeah. for. No, that's, well, that's not how I do with me, is it? I just, I do what I do, and I've always done what I do, and I can't change the style, try, but, you know, that's how it is, I'm afraid. It's just like a fingerprint. You remind me a little bit of Niall Rogers. Have you had that comparison before? Um, no, but thank you very much. That's a very good compliment. <laughs> um, I wish I had his guitar. <laughs> It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But it's the same. It's the same rhythmic. He's doing a lot of that chicken scratching stuff, okay. But the approach is is very very similar in that it's not a dominant style of guitar playing. But if you remove your guitar playing from the song, the song no longer sounds or feels the same. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Um, I get that quite a lot, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I do. I'm busy. Let's put it this way: I'm busy in what I have to do, and I, I put all the different styles that I used to listen to. I mean, I was more of a surfer with music. I was never a dedicated follower. I just used to surf a lot of styles, ranging. I mean, if you ask me, I, I can't tell you because I used to just listen to a guitarist and think, "Oh, I like that style." And I try and learn it myself. There's some styles I can do, some styles I can do. It's, you know, it's just the way. So the disco, the funk was yeah. predominantly sort of um, in that northern soul. Oh, dance, because I like to dance when I go out and get pissed and I heard these tunes. And then there was, then you've got, your, I was into heavy rock, rock. I mean, 80s, 70s, 80s rock. Then I like the twangle, the twangle of the, you know, the Beatles and, all the, the structure that they came up with. So I was more of a surfer of that style. I never stuck with one because I was never proficient at any of them. I'd never get 100%, but I'd, I'd have a go and try them and incorporate into the sound without... Because I thought if I learned all the the rock riffs, the usual, and get into that mode of cover version shit, and I, I wouldn't be here now talking to you. Yeah, that's a reasonable comment, yeah. Who, who inspired you to – it's one thing to be inspired to pick up, but it's another thing to be inspired potentially, if you were inspired by anybody, to become a working musician. Was there anybody in particular or any bands? 
that might have been a catalyst for that? This, well, there's a list of guitarists that I'd listen to more regular than others, but then I'd find another guitarist. I mean, if you want to start naming names, there was, I think the first one was um, Frank Zappa. I was really, I got taken to this lad's house and he used to just shred basically like Frank Zappa and I was fascinated with it. I thought, well, I'll never be able to do that. I tried. I'm not that good at doing it, but I did like the style. And because of learning your scales as well, and then there was Jimi Hendrix, there was um, Dave Gilmore, there was um, the Beatles. They were, I loved some of the guitars on that melodic stuff. Um, Jimi Hendrix, Page. The, the list goes on, you know. I just loved them all, collected them all. And then I'd go into obscure stuff, then I started getting into jazz, and, it, you know, it just carries on and on. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm hearing you. Yeah, what was your what was the first guitar that you used? Going right back to the to the first albums, did you use the same guitar live and on those albums? Well, um, didn't have much money in them days, so I do remember buying my first electric. I think it was an Ario Pro Two, probably. Nice. Copy. Um, All right. Yeah. Yeah. With the first, when they first come out, and you know, it was with Pride and Jar, because I had a guitar case, and um, and that was when I went to meet Sean and Paul to do some sort of, um, just get together and do a cover version of and see how it works. But I was, I turned up with a clean t shirt on, and they were like Perry Boys, total different fashion sense. So, yeah, and um, so that that guitar was my Pride and Joy, and then I just kept changing guitars to find out which was my style really but I can't remember what it was there was a um, what's that Gibson copy one oh, famous one it's probably you. big now I can't remember there's a Gibson copy isn't there what's it called not, not a Les Paul Junior not a Junior or something like that was it I just couldn't imagine you no, playing those big well, rock guitars yeah then I went to one of them but it was semi-acoustic and I was you always get problems with different equipment because, you know, semi-acoustics at a certain volume can start giving loads of feedback and restrict yeah. you. So, um, Epiphone, that was it. Oh, okay. Yep, gotcha. Yep. Yeah, I had an Epiphone. I've had, I've had tons of them, but I'm, I'm, the only guitar I've never had is um, Fender, what they're called? Strat. Yeah. No, not a Strat, the other one. Telecaster. Telecaster. Never had a yeah. Telecaster in my life. I've had a Jaguars, I've still got one now, 1987, no, what is it, 1976 Jaguar, but I need a bit of work on it. But I did like my classics, um, my Gibson Les Paul, that was like, had burns in the headstock and that had been well worn, and that was a 78, 79 one, so that's, I still use that today. Um, but yeah, I've gone through, you go through, what, then it's amps, you go through all sorts of amps just to try and get that, you know, I think I, I never had a Vox. I would have loved to have a proper old, you know, 56 Vox. Never got one of those. Is it 56? AC30, yeah. Nice, yeah. Yeah, AC30. I got shown them. But you see, it was that transition between valves and um, transistors, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and what I found with the valves is when you're touring constant, they start to degrade and they start rattling. And it's okay. It's no, like no. changing your light bulb all the time. And I got fed up of doing it. Because uh, I couldn't rely on techs, I couldn't rely on them to sort of find, you know, so I had to do it myself. It was quite expensive and I had to get hold of, so um, I went to Transistors. Um, there's one that's not, well, Alan Holsworth used to play with the amps and they used mm -hmm. to use me. Is it Alan Holsworth? Is he a guitarist? Yeah, that's the guy. He's the original shredder. Yeah, the guy who influenced Stevie. Yeah, Hallen. well, yeah. I, 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 I can't remember the name of the amps. I'll give it away for some reason. But I had one of them um, for a while, and that was quite good. And that was my first one. And after that, I can't remember what I had next. But guess what? I'm back on valves again. <laughs> well, it's a bit easier, isn't it, these <laughs> days, to do something like that than than to yeah. solid state. Solid state isn't the isn't the home isn't the home ground if you like. It's not the old Trafford if you like for um, guitarists because it's more about. More about economy with uh, with solid state. I use solid state stuff because I'm a bassist and it works. But there's nothing like a yeah, good old... it's really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just an old fart, aren't I? I like my big round sound. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you. 
I don't blame you. You struck me. I always imagined you as just a straightforward tele, uh, Stratocaster player. I'm a, I'm a Strat player as well. But um, you've just oh, yeah, got that. Yeah. You've just got that. You know that same vibe as Niall as well, and he's a Strat player. Too, yeah, so chunky. So yeah. yeah. I like full. It's hard to do. I mean, I do a lot on step on more than all the others, but I do like it. Uh, and I do I do tinker every gig, trying to find different ways of doing things. So every gig for me is unique and for the audience because I try something out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I don't stick to the rules. So yeah. it's um, practice time for me sometimes because, like, you know, you just have to try things, don't you? Oh, definitely. Especially because... Make it more interesting for yourself. Oh, without a doubt, I do the same thing just about every night playing covers. You've got to, otherwise you go crazy. I don't do covers, though. We've never done covers. Yeah, it's uh, – I, I don't know whether I was cut out for the life that you guys have led in terms of the studio. <laughs> and that, I mean, all of the shenanigans and stuff. I think I probably – to be honest, I think I would have been dead years ago. I've got a fragile constitution to a point. Yeah. Well, it was like that in the 90s. I had to just walk away from it all because it, it was doing me mental health no good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm hearing you. Yeah. And then I had a 17-year break. Didn't get involved for 17 years, just took it easy and got a normal job. Because I've got, I've got, I had, you know, a son and a daughter um, and a mortgage and um, start another band up. This was 96. I decided just to, you know, Stop playing. Put me, put me guitars in the loft. I never saw them again for seventeen years, until I started teaching music in schools. As I was desperate. That's great. That's awesome. So you, you're mm. you were the catalyst behind the band coming back out and touring again. Is that correct? Yeah. Good stuff, mate. Yeah. Do you guys get along these well, I days? I actually learn how to play again. Sorry. Oh, that's, well, that's a good point, yeah. Well, I was just asking, do you guys get along these days? Yes, everybody's mellowed out now. Nobody's got any addictions. We're all... I mean, Sean travels with his own driver, so we don't. We only see him on stage. Um, Bez is great. Yeah, we all get on now. Yeah, we're all matured. I mean, if they're 40 years, you don't, then there's something wrong, isn't there? Just try and bury it in the past and try not get to... Um, upset about the past because to be honest it was one of those no no we didn't have mobile phones in them days so it wasn't the case of just ringing you up saying oh are you still alive you know there was none of that so i didn't hear it from anybody for like 17 years and you mentioned up top well you just mentioned a moment ago that you had to learn how to play again so did you come back a better guitarist do you think um yes because um i started teaching in schools and I'd never learned um, your rock riffs that other guitarists learn, like your back in black and, you know, all your, your, all the other rock riffs, you know, and I had to learn all them. Um, I've never done them before because that's what the kids wanted. And it was an education for me. And I spent at least five years learning to play the guitar, but in front of kids that wanted mm. to play guitar. So I learned to read, you know, the crotchets and quavers um, for primary schools, because that's like part of the curriculum. And mm. it was helping me play. And then I ended up in orchestra bands, working with other, you know, mm. musicians, proper musicians. <laughs> I learned a lot um, in the music service for Salford. And that helped me prepare me for the next stage of joining the Mondays again, because at least I was tooled up. And, you know, if I'd have, Probably entered without playing the guitar, it wouldn't have worked. Um, so luckily, it did. But yeah. trying to remember the songs was because it wasn't written down; it was all in my head. Mm. And I had to try and remember what I was playing thirty years ago, which was weird how it works. It came back just like I do remember playing it. But it was finding all the notes in the right area of the fretboard that was, you know, and I didn't, I didn't look at videos. It was constant trying to dig back in your subconscious to try and remember, how did I play that again? Involving capos, tunings and all that shit. And it, it came back. I don't know where. Funny the brain, isn't it? It is, yeah. 
did you listen to Happy Mondays at all in that 17 year break? No, hated it. Mm. That's common. That's a, a bittersweet sort of, you know, memory that I tried to, because I got kicked out of the band and I haven't got a pr problem, if you know what I mean. Sorry, that's my phone going off. No, I haven't got a problem, so I was clean, you know what I mean? I couldn't write under the influence, so somebody's got to, you know. Um, and I was being, you know, oh, we're getting somebody, we're getting Johnny Marr in. All right, okay, fair enough. Oh, shit, yeah. yeah it, was just, oh, it was just mental. Why did they want to bring Johnny in when they brought you? Know, you asked the band that. Yeah. It's a big story. If you know the story, there's a video of Johnny Marr on YouTube um, explaining what had happened. You know, if you've got five minutes, watch. It's funny. Check it out, <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got yeah. – Johnny's a great guitarist, but so are you. You've got an iconic – you've got a sound that if people want to dive into how to play funk and groove, groove riffs over the top of dance music, you're the guy. You're the guy that pioneered that sound. Johnny did something else. Johnny did something completely different. Yeah, yeah, but he was, yeah, yeah, he, he experimented with his amp sounds and uh, his 12 strings and, you know, his linking two guitars together. Well, I didn't have that luxury, really, because um, the more money you've got, the more time you can spend in the studio. And we were quite under pressure to get things done for Factory because. That was under pressure and they were expecting stuff, so you didn't have much time to faff about in the studio, really. But uh, yeah, I know Johnny's brilliant. He's, um, we get on with him, and his guitar style is totally different than mine. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, he's probably a lovely fella. It's not about him as a person, but yeah, I just couldn't imagine. I'll have to go and check it out. Obviously, I haven't dived into that aspect of the, the band's career, but. Some bands, they make some odd decisions at time. You talk about Iron Maiden, they brought in a singer who was untried and untested effectively, certainly at the level that they were at, and it failed miserably. There's a, The 90s, if it was mm -hmm. in the 90s, mate, the 90s were not kind to most rock bands. No, well, that's that's another thing you see, because um, punk ended prog rock. The, the Iron Maiden bands all went, you know, the rock and roll, the heavy rock band sort of was a niche market and the 90s just totally changed what happened in the 70s or 80s with punk so yeah and they had to have their own niche didn't they hmm. like you say it wasn't kind no exactly yeah you mentioned factory records there i mean you, you guys are intertwined with the factory records story so do you think that the uh, co-founder of Factory, so Tony Wilson I'm talking about, and also the founder and manager of Hacienda Nightclub, do you think he gets, he's certainly in the media enough, you can find him through YouTube. I know he's long departed, God rest his soul, but do you feel like he gets enough credit for what he did within the scene? Uh, well, he's had, a, he's had places named after him, so in Manchester, yeah, he does. Hmm. Um, and everybody knows who he is, so, they, you know, you might have a statue somewhere, there's an area called Tony Wilson, something of his memorial. Yeah, he does get recognition. Yeah, there's pictures everywhere of him. So, yeah. And, and then I knew him. He was great. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here because he looked at these, you know, Salford lads who were just learning the trade, weren't going anywhere. But he believed in us where nobody else would. London didn't want to know us or the record company. So, and he just give us what we wanted. He loved Sean. He loved his lyric writing. He thought we were gritty and northern. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for him, like I say, we wouldn't be here now. And he'd give us a great break. I miss him a lot, really. Well, you know, yeah. so sad what happened to him. God, young. He's only a few years older than I am right now talking to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it was Phil Sachs, but I watched a, a series and just just before we got on the call, actually, and there was a, one of your managers. So this is 1988. Whoever was managing you then was saying that he was told not to manage you guys because you guys were a notorious band. You were very difficult to manage. What did he What did he mean by that? Do you think? <laughs> you mean Nathan McGough? Must it must have been? Yeah, I just couldn't find his name online anywhere either. That was all. 
Well, yeah, um, we probably had a point because <laughs> we didn't we didn't give a fuck. <laughs> We're just in it for a, we, it's just a last night out, wasn't it? Just, oh, let's get wrecked and play a bit of music. I mean, it was, to me, it was just because I didn't have any mates because I've just moved into the area. Some to have around. We're just doing it for a lap, really. I didn't think we'd get anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting point because I've read online sources far and wide over the years. And look, you guys are at the centre of a cultural zeitgeist in the north of the UK. That you've already mentioned that you were locked out of London effectively. And look, rave culture, it might have happened regardless. So this is when I was very young. I distinctly remember it coming through the warehouses here in Australia. But th- there's no question that that you guys were instrumental in helping shape rave culture through the late 80s and part of the early 90s. That's my opinion, but do you agree? Uh, yeah, of course I do. I remember when we did Rope for Luck and um, there was no such thing as rave then. Um, we just, I think it was the drugs that we were taking, the trance yeah. sort of music we were getting into at the time and things we were doing and um, vamping on the same side of card. You know, there's only seven cards you can do. Well, eight if you go from C to C, A to A, but it's seven cards. So, you know, when, you, when you're writing, you sort of run out of permutations. So I said, oh, just let's stay on the same card and see what happens and intertwine the melodies over it. But um, it was the vibe and the time and it was just, um, yeah, we, we kept this sort of, we got a bit lazy, but I think it worked. Because I started, if I wanted to do all sorts of different cards progressions because there was so much out there. And then we just got lazy. And that's when the trance came in, the sort of, and the drugs came in, and we just sort of got lost in our, it's like taking acid and getting lost, but it was ease, wasn't it? So we got lost in the ease sort of vibe. And you just, when you're rehearsing, it just, you'd lose yourself in this colourful sort of world of cards. And what's the point in trying to add? And we just, we did get lazy, but it worked for some reason. <laughs> and it wasn't calculated, it just happened. We didn't even know what we were doing because we weren't musicians. None of us were technically grey at what we did. We just just enjoyed playing music in a you know shitty suburb in a warehouse somewhere, stung a piss, and um, just plugged in. And as long as we got electricity, we're all right. How yeah. did you su- how did you survive the recording sessions for Bums? Though I mean, they just sound they just sound next level. Well, the, we rehearsed them before, and then we went into the studio with um, uh, Martin. Was it Martin who did Bond? Uh, yeah, went in the studio, and it, it was a bit weird because Martin's a bit bouncing off the wall all the time. Hmm. Um, yeah, Martin had it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, we just did guide tracks. Did a few, you know, we did guide tracks and then replaced them because we had to. Martin was he was a, he was a, a rhythm person. He liked to get the drums and the bass synced in. Once he got that then he could rely on, you know, the rest, the sugar and spice, and guitars and keyboards over the top. But, yeah, it was a bit was a bit hellish, yeah. Well, we didn't think about it, just that was the norm at the time. I guess my point there, and I should have clarified, sorry, was that I'm only reading from Wikipedia here. God knows if it's true <laughs> or not, so just keep in mind I'm reading here, but 500 ecstasy pills were consumed during the making of that album. That, is, that, <laughs> is that anywhere near true? <laughs> I couldn't tell you, mate, but it sounds a lot, but I, <laughs> no. It's, it's the trouble is I found with the Mondays is it's sort of an exaggeration on a lot oh. of some of the things I wouldn't believe, every, especially if it's on Wikipedia. I wasn't in Wikipedia for 17 years. I've been scrubbed off, so that's how accurate that thing is. Yeah. Often it's the only thing you've got to, particularly if it's got a source, then, you know, Wikipedia, it links to a source. So I checked out the source and I said, okay, well, I'll ask you the question or I'll make the point. But, yeah, it just, uh, yeah, it just sounds 500, okay, 50 is one thing, 500 is something else completely different. <laughs> no, you can't even work, you can't even do anything. It's just, if you're going to do it, like, it might as well smack it and lie on the floor. I've tried them all. And you can't work on certain things and um, he's... I don't know. It's all right for playtime, but not for actually working. You do have to have your fucking scruples and your timing together to actually put things together because it costs money. And if you're off your head, how are you going to do it? 
No, I agree. Yeah, it's it's tough to play after three beers, yet alone bloody getting smashed, isn't it? You know, <laughs> on something else because you just don't function. You might think you do, but when you listen back to the recording, it's horrible. I've done a load of things on that stuff, and I've just like you know, when your neck starts bending, I mean your guitar neck, and you start seeing shit that you shouldn't be seeing, then you realise now I can't work on this stuff. No, yeah, no, no, I get you, yeah. Hey, did, did Tony Wilson, did he ever push for success, like really give you guys a good nudge for success in the United States? In the United States? Well, yeah, yeah. we went over, but um, the American audience are totally different. And it's like the Beatles, they're a bit sceptical about, you know, bands going over. It was okay. It was a good, good tour. It was a massive country like Australia. There's a lot of... Um, yeah, Tony did obviously finance that. And I think, you know, when you, in hindsight, you think, you know, you've got to do it on budget. But we didn't, you say, you just went, <laughs> it was a lot of waste. <laughs> but there always was in factory, a lot of waste. And it wasn't our fault. Definitely wasn't our fault. A lot of waste as in bad business decisions? Decisions and money, yeah. Well, the... I'm straying off the track here because I've got like 40 years of uh, Happy Mondays experience. So, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Was the Hassi, all day. Yeah. But was the Hassi Ender, it sort of built up as this legendary, of course it is legendary. I'm not saying that's a, that's a red herring or what have you. But for you, as someone who was right at the center of that scene, was it when you read back about the way people are describing it who weren't there? eulogising at this sort of thing. Can you relate to any of it or was it just another another place for you to go to have fun? Yeah, it was another place just to go and have fun because it wasn't that when we used to go, it wasn't that busy. You got a lot of students going in there um, and then uh, it attracted a different audience and um, obviously we, we just signed to factory so we got a free ticket to go in. So that was our main place. We'd go to town, have a few beers and go straight in there and it, it changed and it, then the ecstasy got involved and then became some sort of then the music and I think Madonna played on stage and then we were playing on stage and all. It was a showpiece for Factory to put all the new bands on and old bands as well, New Order. So and it, I think it was the, from us playing the whole Factory team creating that vibe that created that legacy that we have now. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point about legacy. I haven't checked... But have you written a biography? Is a biography of yours out there yet? What, my book? Yeah. Uh, I'm not even started. I don't know where to start. Probably one day. Um, but you never know. I might get Alzheimer's. You don't know. <laughs> you should do it, you, especially given your experience and you were there, you are at the centre of it all. You should do it because it's an important historical artefact, those yeah, memories. I'll have to get some, something to follow up. Um, I probably talk more when I've had a lot of drink because it all comes back, flooding back like some, you know, nightmare. Wake up in the middle of the night sweating, thinking, did that really happen? Yeah, I understand these things. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's watch, cool. watch this face. I'll be th I'm th I'll, it's all there. If, if I can remember songs 30 years ago, or well, 17 years ago, then I'll be able to remember... A lot of things. There is um, um, a YouTube about Paul knocking around. Um, Paul Ryder's ex-wife's done some um, podcast, and there's some stories on there that you might find interesting. Okay, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's, it's more more your individual take on these things because there's one thing here, and especially if it's a third party, if you like, someone who wasn't actually part of the band, but the people who were there, you guys have the most interesting take on things because they often oh, can be yeah. the most ab abstract. Yeah, there was all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, it was... Um, Don I could be here all day talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all good, mate, yeah. No, that's fair enough. Look, I'll, I know you've got another one in about 25 minutes' time or so, mate, so I'll let you get off. Oh, is that what it is? Right. I was just looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. well, Go get in <laughs> <laughs> I think it is anyway. That's certainly the schedule I got sent had it, had it sort of the blocks laid out like that. But uh, Oh, yeah. Matt Phillips, you know, he's next, isn't it? Well, it's lovely. It's Andy Inter. Spot on, mate. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Yeah. okay. Well, it's lovely to talk to you. I'm going to get another cup of tea and I'll start again.
<laughs> Go for it, brother. No worries. It's, oh, yeah, oh, it's different. Is that tea or beer? Peppermint tea. Yeah, it's peppermint oh, tea. Oh, I thought it was always. a pint pot. Then I was going to say good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I tend to find um, when I have, if I drink when I'm doing these episodes, I tend to find that I talk too much. And yeah. I have a great time, but when I listen back to it and go, what was I thinking? So that's exactly. why I don't do that. <laughs> well, that's why that's I said it's best dinner it. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before yeah. my hands start shaking, you see. Oh, mate, yeah, we all get them. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll look, I'll be in the audience when you come down, mate, so I'll have a pint for you when, oh, you yeah. when you're playing. Yeah, yeah. Get you backstage or something. Yeah. Oh, it'll be lovely. I'll talk to John about it. We'll see what we can arrange. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It's not that great, to be honest, but there you go. <laughs> no. Nice to, Everybody nice to thinks it's the best place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've done it a fair bit. I know what you mean. It's uh, you just try as a, as a fan. I just try not to intrude. I just go, hey, thanks, great show. No, it's Jeez. fine, it's fine. Jeez. I'm all right. It's the rest of them that don't like, um, you know, my uh, Oh God, yeah, it's yeah. Oh, there is. can be some punishes. Some some people are a bit over enthusiastic and overzealous. I've seen that a few times, but uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think if they're just regular people and they go, great show, you know, that sort of thing, and they're a bit bit more, you know, but it'd be back different. It'd be it. different yeah. in Australia anyway. <laughs> Yeah, we're typically a bit more laid back and a bit more egalitarian about things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Not as many nutters as we've got over here. <laughs> <laughs> so I hear. <laughs> I may be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I would just, you know, why it's true is because there just isn't as many of us over here as what there are, there are over there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, true. Yeah. So. True. But, so, yeah. <laughs> so per head per capita, mate, we might have the same amount, but there just isn't as much overall. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah. All right then, Andy. Nice one, mate. Thanks, nice to mate. talk to you. Likewise, it's been See great. See you in October, is it? <laughs> yep, it's definitely. It's in. Yep, it's in October. There you go. <laughs> no worries, mate. All right, talk okay. to you. Then. See you later. Yeah. So there you have it. Something a bit different. I like to throw something in from the from left of centre occasionally just to mix things up and I appreciate that you as the audience you stick with me on some of these things but Mark is an excellent guitarist do go and check out some of his chops on those Happy Mondays albums from the late 80s and early 90s they're a band that was somewhat of a guilty pleasure I'll uh, say that but bugger that they're a great band got some good vibes some good tunes and I would have loved as I mentioned in the chat to have played bass along to some of his guitar lines back in those days what a time to be in a band it must have been all right so if you like that chat there are more over at scarsandguitars.com and i know you like listening because you're a smart audience and i've written a book check it out click the link in the banner on the website and you'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice you know what to do from there there's some more information to share with you about the book in the moment but before we get to that, I'll bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until next time, it's a goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the... I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton. 
gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and, and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favorite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.